Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I'm used to that from the 11 o'clock crowd. Awesome. Good morning. Today, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 6. You may go ahead and turn there. I'm warming up the message, so we can do two things at once. We may get to Galatians 5 as well. But our primary scripture today is going to be Acts chapter 6. We're just going to focus on eight verses today. Keep it simple and keep it small and keep it all, right? Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. New things are attractive. That's just the way it is, isn't it? You know the price you'll pay for a new car versus a slightly used car that looks basically the same. Once you drive it off a lot, the value goes way down. Why? Because it's new. There's something attractive about new things. Uh, from new relationships, you know that sometimes the first thought that goes into your head, you know, before you're married, you're dating, so things not going well, oh, I'll just get a new one. What's that song, Brand New Girlfriend? Anybody heard that song? It's kind of comical because it captures this idea, right? Sometimes we think that what we need is just something new. Uh, new churches can be very attractive. That's why a new church starts reach more than any other church group in the nation. New church plants are reaching double-digit numbers more than traditional churches do. And for good reason. They're not afraid to embrace new things. God himself says, sing to the Lord a new song. God isn't afraid of change, and neither should we be. But things don't always stay new, do they? As Christians, it's important for us to realize that even after the new wears off of our marriages, even after the new wears off of having teenage children, even when the new wears off of a new job, it's important for us to handle that change of things moving from new to eh, with tact, to handle things scripturally, especially as God's people. As God's people, we're the ones that he has called to reach the entire world. We find out in the beginning of Acts in chapter 1 that Jesus commissioned right after the Gospels in the beginning of the book of Acts. He basically handed off the baton of the responsibility of reaching the entire world to his disciples. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, here in the city. You're going to be my witnesses in Judea, that's the surrounding area, in, in, uh, in Samaria, and in the whole world. Basically, from the inside out, you're going to reach everyone together. Not as individuals. There are no lone range of Christians. Likewise, God has big plans for us. As we look to the context of this scripture, in Acts chapter 1 through about chapter 6, where we're ending here today, this is the an evidence from the text, excuse me, of the first church. A lot of times in church, we'll look back upon this as an idyllic, perfect time, and if we could just get back to the way they did church in the beginning, everything would be wonderful. We think that there was no trouble in that paradise, but that's not true. As we'll discover today, there is a time in even this brand new church that was only months old that trouble came. It just happened. No one knew why. Just like in a lot of the good things God gives to us, troubles come. You know that this happens in your marriages. You can be doing things you feel perfectly, and troubles come. In raising your children, in relating to your parents, in relating to your boss and your employees, in relating to each other as a church, it's specifically and very important to realize that just because things aren't perfect doesn't mean that we should flee, that we should avoid the issue, that we should fight about it. There are very biblical, very Christ-like examples of how we should handle things when the dread C word comes about. Conflict. A lot of us don't like conflict. Or we like it too much. We're going to look today at what happened in Scripture when conflict came into the first church, when trouble came into paradise, and how things were handled in a way that turned a challenge into an opportunity. And I want you to be on the lookout for how we can apply this, not just for our church. If you take a, take a look at this and you don't have much experience in church, or maybe you come from a high church Catholic background or something like that, you might just assume that oh, things should just stay the same. Those guys up on the stage don't have a That's not true. 
We're members of a body. We're all called upon to work things out, right? A lot of times, you parents know this especially, when your children are fighting or when things aren't right, the kids will come up, mom, 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 dad, 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 dad. And almost, you don't even care about what's going on. It's like Bill Cosby says, parents don't care about justice, they care about quiet, right? In effect, a lot of the problems that we have between each other and the church, and they will come, I promise you, you haven't experienced it, you haven't been here very long, or you haven't paid attention. When trouble comes, it is very important that we handle things the way God does, the way God's people have done in a good way to turn challenges into opportunities. You know that this happens in church. As I look around, I see people that I've been in church with for a long time, some of which we could rename our Sunday night business meetings Sunday night fights if we'd have a ring of bell and a pair of boxing gloves. Do we not? Some churches, individually and corporately, choose not to look to a biblical method, to a Christ-like method, for conflict resolution. And that is planning to fail because it's failing to plan. This is everyone's job, not nobody's job. You know how no one's job all of a sudden, you know, becomes everyone's job without recognizing it. Does it get done? Who is supposed to bring this to Christmas? It just slips under I got to get it. Conflict resolution is everyone's job. Let's go with our take on it. If you don't get anything today, we've reduced and distilled and refined this whole message that we're going to read from the scriptures to one point. And that is this. The responsibility for resolving conflict in the church is yours. It's mine. And it's ours. Together we must resolve conflicts God's way. It's not enough to say, I'm a Christian, I, I, my relationship with God is just fine, and I don't need the church. That, that doesn't go, we're going to show you why in Scripture is that way. It's not enough to show up and be at odds with somebody and never handle it in the church. On a more local level, it's not okay to avoid issues in your families, in your, in your office, with your children. We've got to be ready for conflict, because if we're not, it can get the best of us. But if we are, and we follow just what, if we follow what Scripture shows us, some of these challenges, some of these things that kind of weigh us down from our past, relationships that continue to go on unresolved, can turn into opportunities for God's grace, for something that's so much better than we ever thought it could be. I, if I pulled, pulled the audience and just had you raise your hand, I won't, because it's kind of a painful issue. And then I asked the question, how many of you have had relationships strained or end because of the way you handle the conflict? We probably much see universal hand raising, right? All of you can think very easily about a relationship that's not like it used to be because conflict is mishandled either by you or by somebody else or by both. Maybe the issue that came up was nobody's fault, as we're going to read about in Act 6 today. But the responsibility for handling it is ours together. Jesus said, if there is one thing that is more important than anything else, whenever he was asked this in Matthew chapter 22, it's the greatest commandment, love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. Upon these two hang everything else, all the the prophets. If you miss those two, it doesn't matter what you do. Love God, love each other. We're called to something corporate, something together. And if you ignore that, you're sinning. I'm sinning. We're not living in God's will for us if we're failing to love each other as we love God. Let's open our Bibles here to Acts chapter 6. If you're not there already. To set the context one more time, Jesus handed off the responsibility to reach in the whole world in Acts 1. All right? He said, you're going to be one my witnesses all over the world. He says, but don't go anywhere until my Holy Spirit has come to you, right? Very important when handling the conflict that we go with the Holy Spirit. We don't just try to do it on our own. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, and 120 people are filled for the first time. They're spirit-filled, real, legitimate Christians for the first time ever. And they begin to relate to each other in a new way that's never been experienced before. They have the Holy Spirit inside them. They are truly temples of the Holy Spirit. And they can exhibit love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control like they've never been able to do before because God's Spirit is inside them. And that showed in the way that they related to each other. And so at the end of Acts 2, we see the church doing amazing things that some churches today get to do and others don't because they 
fight all the time, they ignore each other, they get sidetracked. The rich people, the poor people, the all, from all racial different backgrounds are coming together and they're selling their stuff and helping out those in need. They're fellowshipping in the, tab, in the temples, they're fellowshipping in their homes, they're sharing food with each other. You know this if you've ever read Acts 2. It was a really sweet honeymoon kind of time. Then, trouble came from the outside. We see this in Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5. Some of the people say, you're trying to change our tradition. Kind of reminds me of Fiddler on the Roof, anybody? Anybody have churches that are kind of like Tevia, some of the pastors on Fiddler on the Roof, you don't know who that is. They love their tradition. That's the thing, right? You don't step on our tradition. The gospel comes second to not playing dominoes in the parlor, right? That happened in Acts chapter 3 through 5. And the Pharisees and some of the people who were in charge, not only of the religious movement then, but also of the, their social situation, political situation, came down on them and said, you guys got to stop what you're doing. You're stepping on our tradition. You've got to eat the way you say eat. You've got to fellowship the way you say. You've got to come to us because we're in charge. We need to respect our authority, right? And they say, we got to obey God rather than you. And uh, some pretty amazing things happened. They were supernaturally released from prison, and there were just amazing things were happening. We're in power. As a matter of fact, I wanted to preach about that from Acts chapter 5. That was the message that I was excited about. God just put it really heavy on my heart to preach Acts chapter 6. Kind of a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. We're going to do it anyway. And then in Acts chapter 6, the situation reverses itself. It's easy to stay together when you're under attack. But after that pressure got off, something happened from the inside out. Well, that's where we begin reading right here. A conflict happens. We'll read through this, and then I'll break it down shortly. Read with me in Acts chapter 6, we'll read verses 1 through 8. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, or Hellenistic, or excuse me, the Hebrew Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered together and, so, and all the congregation and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the reading of the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, men full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put to, with you to whom we may start with this task. And we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they Next slide. chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they brought them before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God kept spreading. The word of God continued, and the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests were becoming obedient to faith. And then Stephen, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Okay, so a lot of this can just go into our mind and get into a Bible filter, and all of a sudden it sounds slow and boring. So let me break this down to you so it makes sense. There were two groups of people here. There were the Hebrew Jews and the Hellenistic Jews, which included everyone who had been outside of Jerusalem and whose families had moved away whenever they were exiled by Babylon and Assyria during the Old Testament times, 500 to 700 years before then. A bunch of them had moved down. They were called Hellenistic Jews. Those of you who pay attention in history class, for you students who see down here, those of you who want to watch the History Channel, remember, Hellenistic means Greek, okay? These are the Greek-speaking Jews because they had gotten out into the land that were taken over by Alexander the Great of Greece. They all started speaking Greek. Now, a lot of them, especially the old ones, were like snowbirds, if you know what those are. The retirees, and when they get in at an older age, they would move back to Jerusalem, to the homeland. But for the ones who moved back to the homeland, things had changed. It wasn't the same anymore. If you have somebody, you might have seen this in your family, somebody who might have grown up in the country, they go off and get that book learning, and get all city fired, and then they come back, and that's not the same anymore, right? There's a little bit of a difference. That's kind of the dynamic that was happening here. These Hellenistic Jews had experienced the world. They'd seen how things worked. They'd even, a lot of them stopped speaking Hebrew in the ways that the Hebrew Jews had. So they didn't look at them the same. Why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because the church had grown in Acts chapter 2. It grew to 3,000 in a day. Talk about a megachurch, 
can't ever get down on mega churches, those ones over a thousand. I like small churches. I like churches like I grew up. That's great. But the first church that ever was around had over a thousand people in, in the first day. Three thousand. Then the next couple of the next couple of stories we see in the months to follow, it was up to five thousand and then six. And by this time, they're not even counting. We see in Acts chapter five that they're not even bringing up numbers anymore. So there's just too many people to count. And when you have more people, you encounter more problems. You've heard the hip-hop song, more money, more problems. More people, more problems is the biblical precedent that we see here. Okay? You can laugh. That's okay. I see it. Whenever there are people, there are problems. If you're married, you know this. Your number doubles, you go from one to two, and all of a sudden you experience a whole new matter of issues that you never thought would be an issue. And things when you were dating that didn't become a thing, now become a thing. And you've got to deal with it. If you don't, the situation's going to deal with you. And you don't want that to happen. So they have a situation here, carrying on with some Hebrew tradition that would take care of their old people. Consider this meals on wheels. Well, they didn't have wheels. Meals on sandals. Well, they had some first. So don't do that. All right? They would deliver food to the elderly people who needed it, the widows. And what happened? They forgot some of the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek Jews, and their widows that came in. Some of them slipped through the cracks. Why? Maybe they didn't look the same. Maybe they didn't show up to the same place. We don't know who's at fault. The scripture doesn't say. It just happened. You ever had that happen in your life before? A situation comes up, alienates you, or estranges you from a friend, someone that was close. All of a sudden, you don't even know what happened. That's what's happening here. But it didn't become a huge thing. So what did they do? The 12 summoned the congregation together. And they said, you know, it's not good that we do this, because obviously we're not good at making sure people are hand, getting food handed out to them, so we're going to point some people to it. And so they sought out some men who were full of the spirit and the wisdom that they put in charge of this task, and they continued doing what they were doing. But they made sure that the problem was being handled. All right? And then to sum it up, they chose some guys with some really hard names to say, except for Stephen and Nicholas. And they uh, commissioned them. They brought them before the apostles. They prayed on them, gave them their authority, and then sent them out. And then we'll check it out. Verse 7. This thing didn't become a thing. This problem didn't stop them or hold them back. This thing that would have divided some churches. I've seen churches divide over less things than this. People who felt overlooked. People who felt slighted by others. The word of God kept on spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase, increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the who? Verse 7, the priests, those who were against them, who said, you're stepping on our tradition. Just by seeing their example, their loving heart, the way they followed the word of God, the way they followed Christ, their enemies started to become saved. They got through something. They weren't broken by conflict. They get away. Then the next verse, then Stephen, full of grace and power, this guy who's been placed at kind of a second fill position, who used to preach the word and go around with Peter and John, but now had to step down a little bit to serve a need. He continued to do his old job, both serving the need and now continuing to preach the word. All right, so what does that mean? So what? What are we going to do with this? The Bible says in James 1.22, not to be hearers of the word and just deceive yourself by sitting and listening, but to do what? Do what it says. Scripture's nothing to us if we don't act on it. So how are we going to act? I want to challenge you with four things. And this is kind of a magical cure-all, right? It's like Windex. It works on everything. In the church and in your own life for conflict resolution, everyone's going to have conflict in your life. Our church is going to continue to experience conflict. And if we fail the plan to handle it in a biblical way, we'll essentially fail. Another church split will be started up in Canton, Texas. And the glory won't go to God for getting through that in a Christ-like way. More relationships. If we, fail, if we fail to do this in our way, we'll continue to estrange others. But when conflict comes, we're ready for it to be glorious. There's nothing sweeter, Scripture says, than when brothers dwell together in unity. I want to give you four things to take home from this passage. Number one, if we are going to take responsibility for solving conflict in the church and in our own lives... If we're going to together resolve conflicts God's way, we've got to do two things. We've got to confront the issue and communicate, whether you're the victim or the aggressor. All right? You've got to step out and say something. A lot of us are afraid of confrontation. Right? That can be a very scary thing. 
Guys, you know this. If your boss ever gets down on you. You think back to the first time when you approached your wife, or those of you who aren't dating later on, it's going to be scary when you have to think, when you have to confront. You ever have to stand up in front of a class to deliver a speech? That can be scary. Confrontation is going to happen, but it's important to confront the issue and not be scared off by it. You know, like I have, there are many, many situations in the church that by avoiding them get very much worse. I hesitate to give this example, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's effective in the last one. If you've ever seen any Monty Python movies, anyone? anyone? Yes, okay. There's a movie called Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail. This is an example of the importance of confronting a situation, just so you don't <laughs> wonder where is he going. There's a scene when this, the king of Arthur, King Arthur, king of the British, is marching through his town, marching through the countryside, and he runs into the Black Knight, all right? And the Black Knight is, you know, a pretty intimidating figure, and he won't get out of the king's way. He needs to get past him. If, if this story is ringing any bells, let me see if we can, just so I know I'm not crazy. Thank you. Okay. And he can't get past this king. Or the king can't get past this guy. They've got an issue. There are needs, all right? And he refuses to get out of the way, so they proceed to sword fight. And the Dark Knight, the Black Knight, that seems so intimidating, loses an arm. It's very, it's faith, it's not real. You can tell that's what makes this movie a comedy. It's pretty absurd, actually. Right? He loses an arm, but refuses to back down. He refuses to even acknowledge that he has an issue, that he's been made. The king's intent to, content to just walk by. He says, you know, you fought nobly, but we're going to go by you now. It's like, no, you're not. You're going to come at me, basically, is what he says. He goes... But your arm's off. And the guy says, no, it isn't. It's only a flesh wound. It's just but a scratch. You remember if you've seen this, right? In the church and in our lives with each other, with our brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, parents, we can do that sometimes. And it's not healthy to fail to confront an issue, to admit that we've been hurt. You can only be loved as much as you are known. Think about that. Somebody doesn't know you, they can't love you. Many husbands know this from going out on dates, right? Or from just walking in your, near your wife, and all of a sudden your slow husband radar starts to go off a little later than it should. Something's probably wrong. Maybe because my wife hasn't said anything, she's not making eye contact, I get a whole bunch of sighs. I ask what's wrong, and she says nothing very quickly. Very strong intonation, nothing. Thank you, thinking something's wrong, you don't know. Is it smart, gentlemen, to fail to confront that issue? To just say, oh, you say nothing, so great, nothing. It's like the cowboys make me mad. No. <laughs> That's not a smart thing to do, is it? Even though you don't want to venture into that area, you don't even know what's wrong. It can be a kind of intimidating place to go, especially if you're just starting. It's important to confront the issue. If you're wounded, if your relationship is wounded, don't act like it's not. That's foolhardy. That's stupid. So we've got to confront the issue. We can't run away from it. Nor do we want to just come back or be passive aggressive or run away. Some of the worst things, some of the worst relational issues that can happen personally, some of you might be a little distant from what I'm talking about in church conflicts, and that's okay. On a personal level, you know this is true. One of the worst things that can happen is for when there's a conflict with family or friends for that conflict and the way that that's poorly handled immediately afterwards to be the end of the relationship, to be where the book stops, to be the end of the story, to be at Christmas, to be at Thanksgiving, and there's a chair and it's empty. And the cousin, the friend, is just on the other side of town, but you haven't seen him in years. God uses us more when we confront the issue, when we communicate, when we cut off communication, that's when things go wrong. My grandfather, my mother's father, my papa, he died of a disease called ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a disease that's pretty much the reverse of Alzheimer's. Instead of keeping your body and slowly losing your mind, those of you who've had this in your family, you know how tragic it is. You keep your mind, but you begin to lose your body. All of a sudden, your hands can't hold things like they used to. All of a sudden, you have to wear leg braces, and then you're in a wheelchair, 
and then you have to carry around a handkerchief because you can't quite hold saliva in your mouth like you used to. It's a tragic thing to see, especially amongst those we love. If there's any metaphor in scripture that describes us as a church and how we're to relate to each other and plan to relate to each other, it's the body. It's brought up more than any other metaphor. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4 says, you yourselves are the body of Christ. We need each other, guys. We've got to be in communication with each other. The Bible says the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you because you're not an eye. We need each other. If we're going to reach the lost, if we're going to reach Mandan County, and it's not just something that we say on the stage and hear from the seats, we're called to do so much more than just talk and listen. Be hearers of the word, do what he says. For those of us who speak these words, for those of us who hear them, it's important. We've got to keep communicating. As a body, we can't be like one which is struck with something like ALS, where we stop communicating with each other, where the brain and the eye and the hand can't get things done that need to get done, where we don't handle things, but instead the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, where you have to look sideways at certain people in the church. That's not the way we're called to be as individuals, as families, as husbands and wives, especially as a church. We are the body of Christ. We are his presence on earth. It's not like the Pope. It's not wrapped up in one man. You and I are the image of God. You and I are his people. When people look at us, literally, they see Christ. That's how you were saved. Think about it. Somebody told you about Jesus by their words and by their deeds. Likewise, we need to do that. And as Jesus said a long time before Abraham Lincoln, a house divided against itself can't stand. We've got to confront the issue and communicate with each other. Move through things and turn challenges into opportunities. The first point that I had for you, to, had for you today was to confront the issue and communicate. Don't avoid it. Don't alienate it. Regardless of your age. Next point, number two. We get this from verse 3 and verse 5. Comply with the Holy Spirit inside you. Whenever they were looking for men to handle this issue, they looked for those full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Whenever they picked those guys, they said, you know, the Holy Spirit's really with them. They're, they're ready to handle this. Likewise, if you're going to handle any issue in your life, make sure you're with the Holy Spirit. Don't go on without Him. If you're trying to go on without the Holy Spirit, in effect, you're trying to go on on your own power. You don't want to do that. Just like Jesus told the, the apostles not to leave Jerusalem until God's Spirit was with them. Don't do anything without God with you. Don't do anything apart from His Holy Spirit guiding you. Pray for it. Pray for it and wait for it. Our next point here. Continue serving your role and commence serving the new need. We see this in, in verse 2, verse 5, and verse 8. One of the easy, one of the quickest things to do, and I know you know this, and I keep saying married guys because I'm dealing with married guys. So, right? One of the easiest responses, and it's cowardly, but it's what we all want to do. Whenever we're compromised or we feel disrespected in our role at work, in the church, in our homes as a child, as a parent, Something that crosses our mind, it does me anyway, is just a bail. I don't need this anyway. I'm out. Right? <coughs> Maybe it's been that you've been laying in bed about to go to sleep and there's an issue and it's like, I don't even feel like dealing with this right now. I'm just going to roll over to this side of the bed and take the covers with me and we can deal with this tomorrow. That's not a good thing, is it? No, it's not. Right? Or a child who storms off because parents made them turn off Minecraft for just a little bit and they didn't want to, so all upset. Or a child who's refused to and the parents just break. If that's the end of the story, things don't go well. We need to continue serving in our roles. Continue doing what we were doing. We see that the apostles do this in verse excuse me, 2 when they said, we can't just stop what we're doing. We can't stop completely doing the good things we're doing, reaching out to people because 7,000, 8,000 people have gotten reached just by doing this. We need to keep doing this, but we need to handle these other issues. So they recruited some more people to handle. We need to continue serving the role. But when a new need comes up, 
And we discover that, hey, someone's been alienated by this. Someone's been hurt by something that I've done. And you discern that need like they did in verses 5 and verse 8. I saw Mike Murdoch this morning. There's a, there's a cup of coffee spilled right back there. And uh, I offered to help him. He goes, no, no, I'm, 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 not too, I'm not too proud to clean up a cup of coffee on the floor. That's everybody's responsibility. Likewise, resolving conflict, resolving situations when they go bad, is also a part of our responsibility. And continuing to serve is also our responsibility. We're a body because we're made up of many different members. And as different members, we all bring something different to the party. Some of us can speak, some of us can encourage, some of us can serve, some of us have a gift of discernment, and we just know when something's not right, we need to be made better. Some of us can relate to people, we're people people. Some of us, we don't want the people people stuff. We want to be back behind the scenes. And that's what makes us so effective. God equips us where we are with special gifts and abilities to be a body, and we need to continue. We can't just opt out and then all of a sudden be down an arm and hope to function the same way. Likewise, we've got to commit serving the new needs. Sometimes we've got to do double duty. Most of your Bibles, if you look between verse 7 and 8 in Acts chapter 6, there's a gap. It'll talk about Stephen, right? And verse 8 isn't included with this. But I'm including it today. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, is performing great wonders and signs among the people. What just happened to Stephen? While he had been preaching and had been spreading the gospel everywhere. He was just placed in second place. Have you ever been think, felt overqualified for a new position? Maybe in, in your job, maybe in the church, somebody says, we really need you to do this right now. I don't want to do that. I've been there. This is what happens to Stephen. Stephen said, hey, we know you're preaching with us, all the guys who walk with Jesus, but we really are so busy right now. Could you please handle this? And he says, yes. He started serving the new need. But what did he continue doing? He continued serving his old role, his old responsibility. He continued preaching. He didn't alienate and say, I'm not going to do this. You can't ask me to go take care of little old ladies. Those aren't even my people. Right? He continued reaching out. And if we look in chapter 7, in chapter, the rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7, we see Stephen, by being willing to be a part of this solution to this problem, not only help this problem from keep it from breaking the church, but we see him reach out in ways that Peter, that John has never even gotten close to. He was even the first to preach the gospel according to Scripture to the Apostle Paul. As a second fiddle kind of guy, he was able to directly witness to the guy who would later write the back out of the hug, pretty much. Likewise, if we get our toes stepped over, if we get asked or we feel God wanting us to clean up coffee or something, we can't say that's below me. We can't feel below us to go handle some issue with somebody that we just can't stand. We've stepped on our toes. It won't work for the church. It won't work for our families and our marriages. It won't work with our children. We've got to confront issues. Serving the new need. <laughs> Our last uh, point of the day, and we skipped it if we'll go back. Uh, something else that we got to do, we got to commit to prayer and in the scriptures. A lot of us want a sign from God. God's not going to necessarily show you anything new that's outside of scripture. Verses 4 and verse 6, when a problem comes up, pray and seek the word about it. It's too much to, uh, God's already given us so much of what we need. If we just follow, if we just obey, we don't need the lightning bolt from God sometimes. We just need to follow through with what he's shown us. As we move forward, I want to show you, show you something real quick. If we'll look to uh, Galatians chapter 5 real quick. Have you ever wondered, I want to, the Bible says to, for us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves spiritually. Scripture gives us a clear way to show if we're handling things God's way or if we're not. If you're a Christian, I want to encourage you to read this with me. And we can, we can see, are we handling things individually? Are we handling things in the church the way we should? It's on your handout if you don't know. There are two lists. Whenever there's a conflict in your life, whenever something comes up and you're like, I don't know whether I should handle this the way I want to or the way God wants me to, there's a way you can check to 
to see if you're in the Spirit. To see if you're with God. Galatians 5, 13 through 25, all right? This is a church that was obviously fighting, and you can tell because Paul told them to stop. All right? Galatians 5, 13 through 25. For you are called to freedom, brethren, not only to turn your freedom, not, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love and service of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, quoting Jesus here, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, next slide, don't do that. But I say if you walk by the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Those bad things that you want, don't want to do, it's like, oh, I can't do this, don't get me around that person. If you're following Christ, if you're in the Spirit, following things God's way, He shows you what you're going to do. You're not going to carry out the desires of the flesh. Here's when you know you're doing something wrong. If you can read down this list with me. Do not carry out the desires of the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things. But if you are, excuse me, we'll just go on to the verse uh, 19 through 21. These are the deeds of the flesh. Immorality. If you find yourself struggling with thoughts of immoral things, that video place that you had, and you just hurt somebody. You know, you can see this is what I'm going to do next time. That's wrong. Don't do that. Impurity. If you just have a sense of escapism, and instead of handling this biblically, you find yourself stumbling by saying cruel things. By putting things before your eyes that you shouldn't as a personal escape. By engaging with some sort of substance to drink or to ingest or anything. And I know not everybody struggles with this. Some of you have been Christians for a long time, but I know some of us do. If you find yourself being led to those things, you're acting in the flesh. Paul would say, stop. Keep in mind, this is written to a church that was in conflict. A church that was fighting, was experiencing family conflict. Idolatry. If you're running to other things and making them worth more to you, sitting in front of Netflix for more hours than you even compare to the times you spend in prayer in the Bible. I walk close to that one sometimes. Sorcery. Okay, this is something that very few of us are probably going to struggle with. You get out of voodoo doll and somebody steps on your toes. That's a no no. You're probably doing things wrongly. Enmities. Just fighting. Strife. Constantly fighting. That's a sign that you're not walking with the Holy Spirit. Jealousy. This is a huge one, isn't it? Something comes up, and all of a sudden we're just, we just can't get over what they have and why we don't have it. Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, or carousing. And this is where the kicker is. But if you're in the Spirit, this is what's going to show you in your life, no matter what comes your way. No matter what kind of personality you have. That's just the kind of person I am. Somebody steps on your toes. No, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You don't do the things you used to do. You don't get mad. You don't run away. You stick in and you stay. And these are what you do. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Because God's in you, you can love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In such things, there is no law. If you have God guiding you, if His Spirit is in you, it's going to come out. That's why Jesus says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in you is going to come out of you. I want to ask you just a personal question. Is God's Spirit in you and moving through you right now? In your personal life? Are you exhibiting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control with those people who rub you the wrong way? If you're not, it's because you're not walking in the Spirit and the Spirit's not in you. That's why it was important in Acts chapter 6 that this was resolved by people who had the Spirit inside them. And as a church... That's all we have in common, really. The Holy Spirit is the only thing that unites us. Doesn't matter what tradition we grow up in, whether we like these songs or these songs, we can get past all that. We're following the Spirit that's inside of us. We gotta love each other more. We gotta love God more than any personal problem we have that would make us run to these evil things. We can't claim that we love God if we don't love our brother. We know that from 1 John chapter 2. Whenever John says that anybody who claims to love God and doesn't love his brother is a what? Liar. That's right. Out here in the country, we don't like to call me a liar. God is. You say you love him more than you love him, and you don't love a neighbor. We've got to love each other because we love God. I'm going to leave you with those things today. Everybody's messed up. Everybody's fallen. Everybody makes mistakes. We're the light of the world. We handle things differently. God's spirit is inside of us. We have a love for each other. If you're walking through problems in your personal life, don't be afraid to 
confront the issue and communicate. Whether you're the one who's gotten his toes stepped on or you're the one who stepped on the toes. Comply with the Holy Spirit. Commit to prayer. Continue serving your role. And if you don't have one, get one. An idle mind is the devil's workshop, but an idle member is the devil's tool. Don't just sit here. God's got more for you than just to come sit in a seat and soak in sour. That makes it too easy to just up and leave if you don't feel important. Gallup poll came out about five years ago that said workers that feel important are much, much more likely to stay than those who just kind of show up and do their job. Don't just show up and do the job of sitting. Plug in. Shake hands. Talk to somebody. Talk to a pastor. Say, where can I plug in so that when conflict comes, I'm not just gone? So that I'm not just an example of spiritual divorce in the church? Well, again, we got to know each other. Nobody went out on a first date and asked somebody to marry the first date. Likewise, if you don't have that quantity time built up in the church of really getting to know each other, you're not going to have the quality time that's going to help you stay through the hard times. Let God work in your life, but let God work amongst all of us together that he might be glorified. It's no big deal if you can get over something with you know, somebody who's right next to you. But if you have somebody you really have beef with, who you say, there's no way I could be right with that person in this church or at your family reunion to Christmas or Easter, somebody that you should have been talking to a long time ago, it may be time to start moving forward again. To confront the issue in your heart with them and to communicate, to comply with the Holy Spirit, you can fix something that we thought was broken forever. By committing to prayer, seeking the scriptures together, and continuing to serve, not alienating. Serving the way you've been serving. Serving the new needs so that it doesn't happen again. That's when we can grow. You know what happens if you only wear clothes that you wore when you were 14? They're going to be grown out. It can mess you up too. Wear shoes that are too small. Likewise, challenges and conflicts can be like that. We need to make changes so that we can grow through. So that we can reach more people. This area is growing. The Metroplex is continuing to grow. They never thought that 20 years ago in Adam. In Anna, Texas. But it's there. In Wachachi, it's there. People are moving to Texas. Like it or not. Lots of people. Yankees are moving to Texas. We're called to reach them. The Bible says, people will know you're a Christian by your what? Your love. In John 13. Oh, Jesus. This is a big, important issue in your families. And as a family of God. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to wrap it up real quick. If uh, if you have something you need to pray about, do it now. Don't wait. My son shows that after two days, we just forget about stuff. Like kids after school. What did you learn about today? I don't even remember. Pray about this now and give it to the Lord. Whatever it is. If you'd like to pray, and it's something, in the early service, we had a handful of people that needed to come forward and just pray about kids that don't want you coming around anymore, about parents that are just fed up with you and your wife, about relationships with people who sit on the other side of this church from you, about a brother who's been estranged for a long time, or a sister. God can move through our conflicts just like he did in the early church, from something that was even a huge racial divide, and do something great, made it where it wasn't even a thing, wouldn't it be great if that thing in your life, that conflict that just hurts you, wasn't even a thing, and God was just glorified in it? Wouldn't it be awesome? God wants it to be that awesome. We've got to give it to Him. He wants to take it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a time of just prayer and, stuff and kind of meditation. If you'd like to sing along, you can sing along. If you'd like to pray where you are, pray where you are. If you want to come forward, I'm going to be down here. The church elder you might be down here to pray with you. After we're done singing, you can go that way and talk and everything. But don't go that way. You need to stay in here and come this way and pray and give this to the Lord. Don't go that way. You need to deal with the Lord this way. Where you are, if you want to come pray, go ahead. We're going to sing. Stephen's going to lead us. And uh, take a moment just to pray to the Lord. And we'll be dismissed. Sing the newborn. There in the light of it.